were wearing shirts that say, end the Fed, that would be step one. Then you'll know what the real interest rate is. <laughs> I am so good at cheap applause lines, man. I got, I got a whole bunch of them. Okay, yes. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, I said I would alternate. That's right, yes. Yes, I'm a small businessman in town, and I try to stay informed about the economy and about politics and everything, because it affects, my, it affects me and my business. And I, I, there's a mystery that I cannot understand. Maybe you can explain. Why does Paul Krugman still have a job? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Paul Krugman. Uh, for those of you in this room who don't know who Paul Krugman is, you don't have to identify yourselves, but let's just say you are some of the happiest people in this room. Um, I, I think it's a case of he, 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 tells, he tells the powers that be what they want to hear. And I have a friend who has, who, uh, I, I'm very lucky that I'm surrounded by geniuses. I know a lot of geniuses and, and I get to learn from them all the time. They think I'm just innocently calling them up to say hello because I'm interested in how their children are doing. And then, then I sneak in a question about interest rates and I just walk away <laughs> nailed them. But, but one of them is a guy named Bob Murphy, Robert P. Murphy. And I really want you to, uh, I mean, I'd like you to go to learnaustrianeconomics.com, but even more than that, I'd like you to go to Bob Murphy's site because he, he should be a household name in this country, Bob. And not just because he's a great karaoke singer, which he indeed is, but his website uh, because his initials are RPM, his, his website is consultingbyrpm.com. Please go to this site and view his blog. He's got his blog up, up there. It's called Free Advice. I, I love that, that name. But the beautiful thing about Bob, he's a young guy, mid-30s. He has written so many articles uh, refuting Krugman. He just reads Krugman's columns and refutes them. But, and, he ref and it's not like he's taking cheap shots at Krugman. Like, he catches Krugman just red-handed misstating the facts repeatedly. So it's not even just that Krugman drew the wrong conclusion. He's not even stating the facts. He's playing f fast and loose with the facts. Bob gets him every single time. And because Bob's two loves in life are smashing Paul Krugman and singing karaoke, he combined those two in a beautiful karaoke thing that he did for YouTube. So I think you could probably find it if you typed in Murphy Krugman. Um, and I'm not going to sing it for you. That would require the wine. But as the, as the song is going on, there are images of Krugman on the screen. And then Bob's columns smashing him or floating around. So please, uh, please check that out. Um, OK, yes. Hi. Um, yes, do you think that uh, changing over to, for example, if everyone today moved to the Austin economic system, mm -hmm. there would be a short-term major economic issues, I would assume that you <laughs> yeah, gosh, boy, that's so Machiavellian, though. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's call for the dumbest policies imaginable. Bring this baby down. And, but, see, but then that, that relies on the, uh, the possibility that then people will say, well, now we really need to listen to Peter Schiff. I'm afraid that maybe people will say, now, wait a minute, now you need Paul Krugman more than ever. I, I don't really know, but you're right. Yeah, there would initially be some kind of sharp downturn, almost certainly, to, to, you know, to, to use the great phrase, to purge the rottenness out of the system. We would have to persuade people that, look, it's just a matter of, it's like a Band-Aid. You can either rip the thing off and then just go on, or you can pick at it for 20 years. You know, which would you prefer? Um, yes. All right. So let's say you have a magic wand, and, and you can get rid of any aspect of the monetary system you want, whether it's Federal Reserve or Fractional Reserve Banking or legal tender laws or what have you. Okay. Which would, you pref which would be the one thing, if you had the power to get rid of, and why? Wow, wow, wow. Gosh, that's so hard to answer. So much to choose from, really. Um, well, sometimes, it depends on the day, actually, because sometimes I think the, the monopolistic character, like I, I like the Ron Paul competing currency thing. Just take the artificial supports off the dollar. Let people use other currencies and be allowed to contract in them. That's the problem, that contracts to deliver in gold or silver are unenforceable in the courts. So that puts them at an artificial disadvantage. Well, that, the free market isn't supposed to have artificial disadvantages, right? That's totally anti-free market. I mean, first of all, we have to phrase this in terms of the free market versus the government. Because usually, uh, because free market economics has been so dominated by the Chicago School for so many years, we just sort of assume that the Fed is like part of the free market. No, no, no. We have to talk about the free market versus the Fed. 
Um, so part of me thinks that would, get to the, that would really help. It would, it would be a, a simple reform that anyone could understand and so that people could become acclimated to the use of another medium of exchange and so that if there is a crisis, they're already acclimated to it. Um, but the other part of me, uh, I, I mean, the other part of me kind of feels like the fractional reserve thing is really key. And there's a guy named Jesus Huerta de Soto, and I refer to his work on LearnAustrianEconomics.com in Spain, who has written a treatise on banking and money in the Austrian Misesian tradition that makes the strongest case legally and economically against fractional reserves that I've ever encountered. And it, it complete, I was on the fence about that. Well, maybe you, know, you should still be allowed to do it. But he actually makes a, a, a very strong legal, moral, and economic case against it. So maybe fractional reserves is the key. Let me interrupt myself, by the way, to say the one question that I really can't answer if somebody were to ask me, and I'm, not, I'm actually not saying this as a joke, because that's legitimate, is what should I do with my money? Because I actually would want to refer you to somebody who's qualified to give you advice like that. Uh, what I have heard one advisor say is that in an economy like this, there are really only two positions. Uh, you can take uh, either the cash position or the fetal position. So there's that. And the second thing is another way that I want to introduce you to my friend Bob Murphy is if I haven't given you enough websites tonight, consulting by rpm.com, learn Austrian economics.com, then there's a third one interview with a zombie.com. Thanks. Please watch this thing. Bob and I did this, it's our first video together. We hoped this to be the beginning of a long collaboration, but Bob so generously offered to portray a zombie in a video to help me promote my new book, Nullification, uh, which I have out there. So please watch it. And then you'll say, look, this guy, he's a zombie, he's a karaoke singer, he is a Krugman slayer. Is there anything this guy can't do? So anyway, um, I forget which one I'm at. Are we down here? Yes, OK. Well, a lot of our experts are that way. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the expiration of the uh, tax cuts because uh, I think an overlooked reason for why there has been kind of an uptick in some economic indicators in recent months is that people are doing this in anticipation of the tax cuts hitting later. So they want to do a lot of stuff now. So I think we're not ready for, for what, what may happen. But I mean, I, I don't see, I wish I could see a happy ending out of this, but the uh, head of the, I guess it's the Dallas Fed, is a guy named Richard Fisher. He estimates the present value of the entitlement liabilities. So that is to say, in perpetuity, what is owed over and above what has been provided for in existing taxes. Uh, he sees that as in excess of $100 trillion. Now, obviously, that can't be paid. And all these uh, phony baloney promises that governments have made to us are just blowing up. They're just blowing up. And they're blowing up all over the world. They're blowing up in, even in Europe, where we're told we're supposed to model ourselves after Europe and they have a great health system. Behind closed doors, the finance ministers of those countries are saying, yeah, of course we know these are going to go bust. Just we won't be around when it happens. Uh, they, they're all saying that because not only do we have the entitlement thing coming, but we have the aging phenomenon coming that is slightly mitigated by immigration into the U.S., but only slightly. And, and that is, this is already hitting Japan. It's going to hit Japan the hardest. But it's going to hit Europe very hard, and the U.S., uh, it's not going to be much better, where by 2040, 2050, we're going to see the number of people aged 65 and over multiplied by two or three times, 85 by two or three times. Um, and that's, it's good that people are living longer. The problem is no one has made provision for this, and everybody's expecting the government to take care of them. By 2050, the number of people in the U.S. above age 100 will have increased by 13 times. 
and these people are going to require a lot more medical resources and so on. There is no, so that in other words, even if we stayed at the same demographic level, age-wise and everything else, it's still a disaster, but we're not staying at that level. And this is not a doomsayer talking, unfortunately. And I'm naturally an optimist, so I hate to be in this role, because these people have already been born. It's not like I'm extrapolating some kind of nightmare scenario. We're in the nightmare scenario. People are already heading to this old age. Uh, what, what are we gonna do? And no one's ready. At least in Japan, they have a cultural tradition whereby there's the expectation that your extended family will take care of you. Whereas in the US, a lot of us have this view that you know, once you turn 18, you have the natural right never to have to talk to your parents ever again. <laughs> like, how are we gonna cope with this? So the answer to how I see this, I mean, I don't see how this could have a happy ending unless, I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't see how to answer that other than people saying, we have to just bite the bullet and we've got to come together as Americans and say, the government got us into this mess. There's no way it can rescue us because it has no resources of its own. It can only rescue us by looting us, and that's precisely the problem. They've looted us too much, and we're trying to fix that. So we as individuals, as Americans, need to grow up and say, then we have to help each other. The government can't help us. We have to help each other. We have to look out for each other. We have to provide for our neighbors. We have to think about skills that we have that we can volunteer to provide for people who need them. We're going to need to do something like this, a giant Craigslist where we can exchange skills and goods and things that we can, in effect, share with each other to see ourselves through this crisis that's coming, because I don't see any other way. Okay, um, yes. Um, hi, I'm a semi-regular reader of the uh, Wall Street Journal, and recently I've seen a couple stories or reports on um, uh, the federal government is uh, introducing another stimulus bill, like another like $700 billion. And also, um, there's another story today about a uh, process or a policy that the uh, Fed wants to institute called quantitative easing, yeah. uh, which is like the um, purchase of 10-year Treasury bonds in order to drive the interest rate down. Yeah, it's just inflation. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering, um, what are the Austrian economists uh, trying to do to um, stop these bad policies, um, to, to stop the like, policymakers ending, like, easing that break, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, the stimulus I've heard about is 150 billion. It's like 50 billion for infrastructure and 100 billion for uh, research and development credits or something like that. Um, what are they doing? Well, I mean, all we can do is just the only tool we have is education and ideas. That's the only tool we have. I mean, they have the money that, you know, that, I mean, because uh, they. Uh, the stimulus packages have nothing to do with economic recovery. I mean, e even the economics profession. For years, you don't see fiscal, you haven't seen fiscal stimulus in this sort of crude form talked about even in the textbooks. Like they, they've abandoned this a long time ago, but the politicians love it because in the, it's a, it's a win-win because in the name of saving the economy, they can hand out loot to their friends. Like what, what's the downside to this? So all we have are ideas. The one saving grace to this though is that ideas are infinitely reproducible. Theoretically, everybody in the world can listen to you know, a five-minute podcast about, about this subject. Uh, everybody in the world can, uh, you, you can be a student at the Mises University program we have every year. Because all you have to do is sit, sit home and for free, just watch the live stream. And for a whole week, we have an intensive course that we offer to college students who come to visit us. And you can just sit there and everybody theoretically can absorb all this. That's the one thing that's on our side. We've never had anything like this before. I mean, as one of my friends puts it, it's like Gutenberg, but times a million. Because Gutenberg was a great liberator in some ways, uh, and, and people could spread ideas around. But paper is limited, publishing resources are limited, but ideas through the internet are infinitely reproducible. Everybody can look at them at the same time. You don't have to lend your copy to somebody else. We can all look at them at the same time. So we have at our disposal an infinite resource. And, and so, you know, we have to make the best of that. I don't see what other approach there is. And there are some people in government, I th think, who try and give good speeches once in a while. Uh, you know, Ron Paul, I guess. Uh, and, and I'm sure there are people more on a local level, but in the federal government, it's very, very hard to take the Republican Party seriously about fiscal responsibility. I mean, it really, it's like they're not even admitting, well, you know, okay, look, we have a bad track record. I mean, I would at least appreciate that. You know, look, we, we really went off the rails, but we've, we've got religion, and now we're going to see things through. I, I just, you know, when they get elected in 2010 and have a great track record, then I'll change my mind. <laughs> Till then, I remain skeptical. Uh, yes. 